Good afternoon. I hope you're all doing well. Um, thank you so much for joining us for this session. Welcome to the Time of the Writer Festival and also the book launch of Alternation African Scholarship Series, Volume 1 to 4. I will just want to start off the session by recognizing our partners and sponsors for this year's festival. I would like to recognize the University of KwaZulu Natal, the National Institute for Humanities and Social Sciences, Stan Foundation, the Foundation for Human Rights, um, Hear My Voice Institute, um, French Institute of South Africa, Amazwi, South African Museum of Literature, the Wazulu Natal Department of Arts and Culture, the National Department of Sports, Arts and Culture, and also recognize our um, MBISA, Journal for African Writing, who are our media partner. Um, just want to say thank you so much for the support. We're in the fourth day of the Time of the Writer Festival and tune in for the session. I hope you enjoy it. I would like to hand it over to Prof Muletane to take over the launch. Thank you so much. Um, good afternoon, everybody. Um, as has been said, my name is uh, Relebu Hile Muletane, otherwise known as Lebu. A professor in the School of Education in the College of Humanities at uh, UKZN. And I'll be moderating uh, the discussions this afternoon. Um, we have in store for you um, two um, launches actually, rather than one. Um, first, we are launching the Alternation book series and we will get to that um, a little bit later. And secondly, we're launching the, four, the first four volumes of, of, of the series um, this afternoon. But before we do that, I'll call upon um, Professor Gladram Kize, who is our um, uh, uh, DVC and Head of College of Humanities, um, to say a few words of welcome and to talk a, a little bit about uh, the Humanities Institute um, in which uh, this project is located. Uh, Professor Mkise. Thank you very much, Program Director, and uh, good afternoon, fellow panelists, and uh, ladies and gentlemen. It is my pleasure indeed to welcome you this afternoon. I will be saying a few words about the Institute in which many of the activities that we are conducting in the college are located. The launch of this Alternation African Scholarship book series coincides with one of the most significant events in the calendar of the nation and our national and African consciousness, namely the transitioning to the next world of Ingonyama Yamazulu, Upecha Nepumestruini Umlokombane. The College of Humanities hereby expresses our deepest sorrow to the house of Ingosi Ujama, the house of Ingosi Senzangakona, the house of Notumetlezi, Mbomboshomnyama, Nsimu Duavelange Siluba, Chininindi Omnyama, arguably the greatest warrior king and freedom fighter the House of Chama has ever produced, the legendary Princess Mkaba Ega Chama, the House of Ntania, the matriarch of the Amazulu nation. We pray that the first read of the nation, Ushlangalum Tlabati, be safe as he makes his arduous journey towards the land of his ancestors, and may he become a great Itongo to the nation. Reflecting on the significance of this event is opportune for us, and more so because the book series is known as the Alternation African Scholarship Book Series. Of equal importance, therefore, is how do we insert the historically marginalized voices into the higher education landscape? and to knowledge in general, including the contributions of African kingdoms in resisting 
colonialism. How do we prevent the COVID-19 pandemic from entrenching the digital knowledge divide? It is therefore important, ladies and gentlemen, that as we move forward, we need to commit ourselves fully to the unearthing, critical examination and documentation of the historical contribution of the continent to global knowledge. This we need to examine dating back to the time that the Homo sapiens sapiens humanity in general stood on two legs somewhere along the fertile Happy or Nile Valley before migrating out of the continent to populate the rest of the world, giving rise to the many beautiful and diverse human forms that we have today. The current project is being rolled out in partnership with the Humanities Institute of the College of Humanities. Allow me to pause here to acknowledge the encouragement and support that we have received from the Vice Chancellor, Professor Nanapoku, towards the establishment of the Institute. The Institute will advance the African Humanities Project, part of which is to engage the humanities issues from the perspective of the South, bearing in mind the different ecologies of knowledge in which we are located, which are sometimes complementary, but also contradictory at times. The project seeks to address the global cognitive injustices and to contribute to world knowledge on equal terms with the rest of the world. So with these words, I'm very, very happy to introduce the Humanities Institute located in the College of Humanities, and also to introduce Professor Yanni Smith, who is our director of the Institute. I thank you. Thank you, uh, Professor Mkise, uh, for those um, encouraging words, um, encouraging African scholarship, um, I will hope that um, young academics are listening attentively and are going to locate their work within that uh, kind of thinking. I will now call upon uh, Professor S uh, Smith um, to talk to us uh, about the Alternation African Scholarship uh, book series. Professor Smith. Uh, good afternoon, colleagues. Uh, good afternoon, Prof. Uh, Molezane and DVC, Professor McKise. As well as uh, as you are well breaking, as Yanni. Um, okay, uh, is it better now? Yes, yes, yes. Okay, uh, thank you very much for this uh, introduction, brief introduction to the uh, Humanities Institute as well as to the African Scholarship Book Series. Uh, if I may say one or two things about the Humanities Institute, it is a specialist project of the College of Humanities, uh, and this project is aimed at the advancement at cutting edge research in the African humanities, including the African digital humanities uh, on the African continent. And um, we want to uh, emphasize that um, we will have specific projects and project areas that we have already initiated uh, in which specialist projects um, uh, and, 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 and research uh, knowledge will be produced uh, with regard to specific outcomes. In this regard, we do have what we have been calling signature project areas. And some of these signature project areas include uh, focuses like the transformation of higher education on the African continent, um, African identity and social formations on the African continent, as well as topics related to climate change, natural disasters, pandemics, and so on. 
another pressing area that we will be developing uh, and that we will be researching is uh, the world of work of young academics, also of young academics from the humanities disciplines in the country and on the continent. Uh, we think that it is crucially important for the continent to not only recognize the huge contribution that the humanities are making towards the well-being of our nations and of the well-being of our communities uh, interactively, but also um, with regard to the huge contribution that academics are making towards the knowledge produced in these communities and the uh, world of work and the opportunities in the world of work um, that are being generated on the continent and that we see can be generated, especially from perspectives of the African digital humanities in the future. And for this uh, purpose, the Humanities Institute also has uh, already established quite a number of national, continental, as well as international uh, linkages. And we will be pursuing a multilateral uh, um, arena of uh, links uh, with uh, people who want to support but also want to benefit from the humanities knowledge and African scholarship uh, that we are in the process of producing and that we have been producing for quite some time and that we will continue to produce as we go into the future. I may also just mention that um, African ethics as well as health and healing, especially in this time of the pandemic, is of crucial importance for us and also for our communities and uh, much research is already being conducted in this area also during the uh, year of the pandemic that we have been experiencing over the last just more than a year in South Africa and in the SADC region as well as on the African continent more widely speaking. So cutting edge knowledge production that is what the Humanities Institute will hopefully contribute to and it has already contributed quite substantially to cutting edge knowledge production in terms of um, topics as they arrive and as we are confronted with certain challenges in academia on the African continent and more widely afield. So uh, with regard to the um, with this uh, broad based project, we also seek to, uh, to develop capacity in the African humanities, uh, capacity development, uh, research capabilities and abilities of our young and upcoming researchers is foremost in our mind. And uh, we have started with certain uh, initiatives in this area, also including the very important specialized area of supervision in the African uh, humanities and um, the kind of skills and knowledge and content knowledge um, that are required for research supervision in the African humanities, especially as we transform, as the DVC have said, from this legacy of colonization and of uh, apartheid that we have experienced in South Africa and Southern Africa to a decolonized education, a truly African grounded education and knowledge that we produce uh, on the African continent. Um, and that is focused on uh, uh, benefits towards the peoples and the people uh, in Southern Africa, as well as on the continent, more broadly speaking. Uh, finally, let me just say that when we talk about the African humanities, it's not uh, only focused on the traditional arts and humanities and social sciences disciplines. We also raise questions about the natural sciences, uh, the law and uh, the information technology sciences and questions about governance, which is extremely important also in our region about the the, the the notion of personhood and the notion of the human that do play a role in these disciplines and in these sciences and for that uh, in that focus we have had quite a number of very substantial contributions already 
that have been published over the last number of years, and we are looking forward to uh, much more uh, substantive co collaboration in this regard in the near future. Uh, those are a few words just about to the uh, Humanities Institute. And uh, let me just conclude uh, focusing on the African Scholarship Book Series. The, it is called African Scholarship because it feeds into this vision that we have for the Humanities Institute on all its different levels. And um, it is African Scholarship by Africans, for Africans, with our communities, inclusive of our communities, knowledge that we produce that serve our communities and serve all equally. And uh, for that, we are tapping into existing networks that have been created, especially since the uh, very epistemically very important date of 1994 in South Africa, where South Africa could at long last also join the rest of the African continent as a free nation. And that also had reverberations throughout our disciplines, especially in the African humanities and the human and social sciences. So um, uh, that is a very important focus for us. And to contribute, we support interdisciplinary research, uh, multidisciplinary research. We support discipline-specific research focusing on specific problems and challenges that we experience, but also transdisciplinary research. If I may just say that what we mean by interdisciplinary research um, uh, is research that is focused on specific thematized questions, thematized challenges that we face on the continent, as well as on uh, matters that we have to focus on uh, that are not only located and uh, limited to one specific discipline, but re questions that we need to raise that are truly transdisciplinary and also questions that need to be raised not only in the human and social sciences, but also in the natural sciences, law, governance, and also management sciences. Uh, Prof, over to you. Thank you. Uh, this is just a brief overview, and uh, we can come back to some of these matters as we go forward. Much appreciated. Um, uh, thank you, uh, uh, Professor Smith. Before you uh, go away, in the African um, Scholarship Book Series, each, each of the areas um, have, uh, or the, the project has, has identified lead editors. Could you tell us why that is and what the role of the lead editors will be? Uh, yes, Prof, thank you so much. Uh, we do have lead editors and these uh, lead editors are hub leaders in specific discipline and interdisciplinary areas of expertise. Now the lead editors, um, uh, it, is, it is on the one hand up to the lead editors to take initiatives towards the uh, sourcing, developing research projects and sourcing of research focused on specific research projects. And um, in that regard, all of these lead editors have been uh, in such a position with other journals and with other publishing houses and so on. So they know how to do it and when to do it and what to do. So it's not people that are new in these uh, uh, positions. They know how to do it. That is on the one side from the side of the lead editor. Then from the side of the general academic public, um, if they are academics, that uh, wish to also contribute to any of the projects that will be advertised widely, they are welcome to do so. And as we have seen with our recent publications around COVID, for example, there are um, collaborations from across the subcontinent in Africa, but also larger from Africa. And we have on last count more than 20 different uh, 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 states that have been contributing to publications. So um, from the initiatives of um, the uh, general academic public, they will be able to identify and then contact lead editors with regard to their contributions. The second uh, focus is that we will also be publishing monographs. And uh, with that said, 
Um, we mean that um, academics in the human and social sciences who have been working on a monograph, a single book publication, they will have to find and identify the lead editor with whom they will be working towards the publication of that monograph. So that will be some interaction between the lead editor and between the author or the authors, if there's one or more uh, authors. And um, we hope to, um, to, to, to state all these requirements, processes and procedures on the website that we will be opening up, hopefully at the beginning of April, that people will be able to access. At the moment, we are, how, how, we are um, housing the alternation African scholarship book series as a in a sub archive on the well known um, alternation journal archive but as from the beginning of April, the alternation African scholarship book series will have its own website, and uh, then we will take it from there. Thanks, Prof. And thank you, uh, Professor Ayani. And um, that brings us to the end of our first launch of the Alternation African Scholarship Book Series. Um, we now move to our second and main launch, I, I, I suppose, uh, of today, the, the launch of the four uh, volumes, um, four first volumes of the African uh, Scholarship Book Series. Um, and um, to introduce us to these four volumes, I'll call upon the lead editors um, uh, of, the, of the volumes. The first lead editor is Professor uh, Labi uh, Ramratan, who is a professor in the School of Education. And he led or edited or led the editing of the volume titled Rethinking the Humanities Curriculum in the Time of COVID-19. Professor Ramratan. Good afternoon, uh, panel. Good afternoon, colleagues. Good afternoon to all the people that have come into this session. Thank you very much for coming and sharing this afternoon with us. So here's a copy of the first book. Um, the second. the third, and the fourth. So just to talk a little bit about uh, the book itself, um, I, for the last three years, have been leading the um, humanities curriculum transformation process within the University of KwaZulu-Natal. And in my experience of over the last three years, there wasn't too much of uptake by the academic staff in terms of trying to transform the curriculum, especially moving into digital spaces and rethinking what they teach in terms of our drive to transform our curriculum within the whole transformation of higher education curriculum, as well as within the decolonization and, and neoliberal debates. Uh, that's um, engaged across all institutions, both nationally and internationally. Um, but when COVID-19 came about, there was a rapid, very quick response to change over from our traditional face-to-face -face and into the digital um, platforms to teach, assess, and get our learners to learn, our students to learn. And what we try to do is to capture some of those moments, the early moments of the lockdown that actually propelled our staff into the digital terrain. And one of the chapters in the book really speaks about the agility and the resilience and the opportunities that made themselves available to actually move very quickly and rapidly into the digital platform. So the three years that I spent was upscaled and fast-tracked within three months into the digital platform. So this book, there's a chapter in this book that talks about this, but more central to the book. And when you talk about, um, you know, Yanni spoke about uh, the series trying to be on the cutting edge of knowledge production. 
And the conceptualization of this book happened just after the university lockdown. And within the space of about 10 months, we were able to produce four volumes of the book, suggesting that there is potential, there is capabilities, and it is possible to actually contribute towards the knowledge base in a profound way through a fast tracking process of publishing seminal work and the African book series allows us to do this and it is, we've demonstrated its potential. So coming back to the focus of the book on curriculum, we seldom ask this question, what, and this is really the fundamental question, curriculum question of what and whose knowledge is most worthwhile. And especially within the context of this pandemic and within the context of South Africa and the global changes in terms of the 21st century, have we fundamentally begin to rethink what we offer to our students and how what we offer is relevance to us here in South Africa, in Africa, and being part of the global citizen. So this book basically, my chapter especially, asks those fundamental questions about how have we decided what we should teach? Should we begin to rely only on what other people say or as part of the heritage that this is what we taught, we must continue. We as academics have the agency to understand and to be able to propose curriculum that we should be, that we think would be meaningful, obviously in dialogue with the community, the context and the students. And so this book begins to question, um, pro provide or uh, ask those kinds of questions within this, this, this volume. Um, a little bit about the authors. I think the authors that have contributed to this volume as well as the other volumes, they come from a range of institutional contexts and from across the South Africa and beyond. And this is what's interesting about this. It's not just a South African perspective or an institutional perspective. It covers a range of perspectives within the entire country and beyond our borders into neighboring countries as well. So the richness of what you read in this book brings out the diversity, the challenges, the issues that we're grappling with. And as Deleuze talks about rhizomes, you'll be able to realize that different things emerge in different contexts, but they're talking about the same issues and same, uh, same issues, but in different contexts and not being influenced by each other. So this book attempts to bring that. A second thing important about this book is that it is an initial response to COVID. And as Yanni said, we really would like the series to be topical, to be useful, to have some relevance. And so COVID-19 had provided that topicalness that we can actually bring to the knowledge base and to the scholarship around the humanities curriculum. So in this respect, uh, for example, we were able to capture the initial responses of individuals as they respond to the key question that this, book, that this volume asks, which is how have institutions responded to institutional closures and the protection and protection of the integrity of what has been taught, learned, and assessed within the humanities curriculum. So the chapters within this book really speak to those issues around that. So it ranges from how have you conceptualized, for example, teaching and learning the digital platform that responds to the issues of, of uh, closure, uh, institutional closure and integrity of what we teach and learn. So some highlights of this book is, there are some authors like Shan, for example, speaks about the beauty and power of disruption. Really a 21st century characteristic that all of us need to embrace. And if we cannot live within disruptions like COVID-19, uh, then we are in serious trouble. And so this, uh, this chapter really talks about how wonderful it is to think a few uh, afresh, think anew, and begin to talk about different ways of thinking about it. Nokukanya and others speak about the massification of higher, higher education, a, phen a phenomenon that has been you know, a global issue of the, the, the need for higher education and how the massification of higher education necessitates us to find new ways in, uh, of teaching, learning, and assessing 
in confined spaces like university campuses. Uh, Crystal and Zainid talks about the agility of academics to change. Um, again, the question about uh, what knowledge is, is most powerful, you know, this is also Crane Sudin speaks about um, our, our pedantic focus on curriculum content coverage. Um, so we really need to think about uh, the curriculum has a fundamental issue around how we move and transform curriculum. Just one last point, which is really a chapter which I think all of us should read. Uh, and it's uh, uh, written by Ashwin Desai. And he talks, uh, he uses a book, uh, When the Machine Stops. And he uses the book as a way to begin to talk about how we should live within the context of a pandemic, within the context of a disease. And if we're stuck in our cocoons and encase ourselves in a machine, we might miss, on, miss out on the opportunities that um, the new world presents to us. So I'll stop here and let others speak about the other volumes. Thank you. Thank you, Professor Ramratan. Um, the second volume in the series is led by Professor Nobu Shleshongwa and it's titled Technology-Based Teaching and Learning in Higher Education During the Time of COVID-19. Professor Shongwa. Thank you very much, uh, Program Director, uh, Professor Molitsan. Um, uh, I would like to greet all uh, our writers uh, who are tuning in, but um, special greetings uh, to our DVC uh, and Head of Humanities College, uh, Professor Ntantan Kize, um, our Director for Humanities Institute, uh, Professor Smith, um, my colleague, uh, uh, Professor Ramrathan, uh, who was the lead editor for, for the first volume. Um, um, Ismail Mohammed, our Director for CCA, uh, and all the staff members within the Center for Creative Arts. Um, thank you very much, uh, Prof. Moletane, um, for, for this opportunity uh, to share with, uh, with our writers out there um, what we have done uh, during the time, uh, initial uh, phase uh, of COVID-19 uh, in, 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 in our space uh, as academics. Um, with the volume two, uh, I'm happy Prof. Ramrathan has uh, gone through uh, the introduction and also Prof. Smith has gone through the introduction in terms of the ABS series. Um, when, when COVID took place, um, what happened was that um, government all over the world um, struggled, especially with higher education in terms of what to do uh, at that time. So, um, a state of emergency protocol uh, was then uh, implemented. Uh, and at that time, it aimed at restricting the movement and gathering of people. And that resulted in mass quarantine and stay at home across, across the world. So it was very, very difficult at that time uh, to provide uh, face to face um, our teaching. Um, so what then happened um, was that um, collaborative work uh, of, of, of the group um, led by Prof. Smith um, we uh, agreed that like it was time that as humanities and social science, uh, we contribute uh, towards uh, publishing and towards uh, knowledge production. And we used uh, COVID-19 uh, as the opportunity for us to, to do that and uh, to build to the 25 years uh, of, of the publication of the Alternation Journal. And we built on that as we were introducing um, the series. And um, just to go uh, to, to, the, to, the, to the volume two, um, which um, is entitled Technology-Based Teaching and Learning uh, in Higher Education During the Time uh, of COVID-19. Um, technology is, is actually vital. This volume focuses on the use of technology in providing teaching and learning uh, in higher education. Um, so technology uh, ensured that year 2020 uh, was not lost uh, through the adoption of the new ways uh, of teaching and learning. Ways that were not used to, uh, they were new uh, to many of the academics across the globe, but especially in, in, in the country and especially in the, in, in the SADC. Um, so what, what is actually covered by, by this book is uh, various benefits uh, of using technology 
uh, in, in, in teaching and learning. Um, six important benefits um, are actually important uh, to note that, uh, for example, that technology improves uh, engagement uh, of, of students uh, in the classroom. It could be an online classroom. It also improves the, the knowledge retention uh, and it also encourages individual learning. Um, and it, encar it encourages collaboration. Um, in most cases, students like to work individually, um, but like with uh, using technology, this encourages uh, uh, collaboration on the side of the students. And uh, more importantly, students can learn useful life skills through the use of the technology. And as for the teachers or the lecturers, um, it has huge benefits uh, for them as it uh, opens up uh, new frontiers uh, for them. Um, so in a higher education environment, uh, Prof. Mletani, um, technology can encourage active participation um, in the learning process. Um, and this is usually a challenge to manage in a, in a traditional uh, classroom. So you will know, um, for example, at the University of KwaZulu-Natal, where we are based, um, we sometimes have large classes um, and it's very difficult to get um, our students to participate um, at the same time. But with technology, um, things are actually really, really changing. Um, and we have seen that uh, during the course of, of, of teaching using the online teaching. Um, so what this volume has done is that like, it has documented uh, experiences of university lecturers, scholars and professional staff on the use of technology to support uh, teaching and learning, including assessments. Uh, in higher education during the time of COVID-19. In particular, um, the different chapters um, explore the opportunities and challenges of switching to online teaching learning platforms. Um, so this second volume has, uh, has 10 chapters. Almost all the, all the, all the volumes have 10 chapters. Um, just briefly um, to, to go through some of, of, of these chapters. Um, the opening chapter uh, by Nelly uh, Mwale and, uh, and, and Joseph, um, it's um, uh, an important chapter that is a contribution from colleagues in Zambia. Um, as uh, my colleague has alluded to, so contributions here are not only from the country from South Africa, but uh, from the SADC, uh, international uh, scholars as well have also contributed. So it's um, a, a contribution from the University of Zambia uh, in terms of uh, how they have dealt uh, with the introduction of e-learning. So these authors um, in, the, in this chapter, um, they look at student responses um, in terms of uh, what, uh, 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 what drove uh, the students in terms of uh, uh, the online teaching, what were the experiences and what were the experiences of the, of the teachers in terms of using e-learning platforms. Um, and it's, it's, it's a very uh, important chapter to read um, to get a feel of what other universities and what other countries have gone through uh, in terms of uh, introducing uh, online or using technology in teaching and learning. So is the, the second chapter, um, which is a contribution uh, from Session uh, and, and his team. Uh, in, in their chapter, they focus on the review uh, of the current virtual platforms and, and the digital tools. Um, and uh, what they say is that like it offers some commentary uh, on the preparedness of lecturers and learners in the higher education sector to embrace e-learning technologies, uh, speci specifically for practicals. Uh, we had a huge challenge um, when we began the online teaching in that most of the practicals in many universities um, began late uh, because like we were cautious uh, of the health uh, protocols. So dealing with practicals was something that universities had to manage um, uh, very carefully. Uh, so this chapter presents um, that focus in terms of how practicals uh, had to be uh, offered uh, remotely. Then the other chapters are also um, talk about other technologies um, that were also used, uh, for example, there is a chapter that uh, was written by um, Merisi and, and, and the Pillay, where they explore how academics uh, understand the possible opportunities that may be harnessed in the higher education sector in the course of the, of the present pandemic and also, uh, also paving the way for, for the fourth industrial revolution, uh, while also fully understanding the many challenges that are there. Um, so it is a very, very important chapter because when we were talking about uh, 4IR, people were thinking that like, 
how will education be like? Will, are we going to be ready as higher education institutions to deal with it? But COVID-19 happened and it forced us um, to, to come up with innovative ways in terms of, uh, of teaching and learning. Um, so the, the other chapters um, are by Andrew, chapter five, and also chapter six uh, by Nosipo. Um, these are also important chapters that draw on the uh, community of inquiry framework uh, to argue for the use of Facebook. Um, you know, everybody is using Facebook. As we are here right now launching this book, Facebook is one of the, of the, of the networks that we're actually using um, to, to communicate. Um, so they're arguing for the use of Facebook. And the next chapter, which is chapter seven by my professor uh, Chikoko, um, he has made argument for the use of WhatsApp. Um, and uh, he, he has gone uh, to explain how he used WhatsApp um, to teach his master's module successfully, which is a very good thing. Um, so the social media, uh, the other technologies that are there have been very, very useful. So in this uh, volume, the focus has been mainly uh, on all these technologies that have been used. The last chapter, which is the most important one, especially for this festival, uh, Prof. Letani, is a chapter contributed by Sakile Gumete, Sipindele Shongwa, who is the curator of Time of the Writer and myself. Um, this chapter talks about the Time of the Writer, which is this current festival. This was the first literary festival that was hosted virtually in 2020. Um, we were only left with about two or three days before Time of the Writer uh, took place. And the president announced lockdown. And we, we either had to cancel the time of the writer or go virtual. So this is a very important chapter where we document how we went about preparing for the, for the virtual um, um, our time of the writer festival within a space of a few days. When for months we had been preparing for a face-to-face -face festival, then we had to go virtual. So it documented that and uh, it also uh, shares methods um, that we used, um, uh, social media platforms, the Instagram, the Twitter, YouTube, you name it, Facebook, um, the radio stations, how they came uh, to assist. Um, and it's making uh, important recommendations um, in terms of uh, uh, other festivals that uh, came afterwards. And also uh, it, it has uh, uh, made important recommendations in terms of, of, of delivering emergency remote teaching and learning in higher education institutions as we, as we have seen uh, right now, even 2021, um, higher education institutions are continuing to offer online teaching and learning. So the, these chapters are actually the entire volume is relevant uh, to read uh, throughout uh, as we continue to grapple with the challenges presented by COVID-19. Thank you very much, uh, Prof. Nathan. Um, thank you, uh, Professor Shongwa. In the interest of time, we will move directly to the uh, third volume, which is um, uh, led by our very own DVC, Professor Ntlantlam Kize, and it's titled teaching and learning in higher education in the time of COVID. Prof Mkize. Thank you again, uh, program uh, director. Uh, as it has been indicated, the title of this volume is teaching and learning in higher education in the time of COVID. The corona pandemic, as you are all aware, laid bare many injustices in the world, not only in the health and economic spheres, but also in the educational spheres. Volume three addresses some of these injustices with a special focus on how both learners and academics and members of the professional staff have responded to the challenges of delivering e-learning. The chapters in this volume recognize that teaching and learning is not about the delivery of information from one source to another. Rather, it is an integral aspect of one's identity 
and as such, it should be considered in social and relational terms. In other words, it is a social practice. The chapters recognize that to implement e-learning fully, we need to come to terms with the social and cultural positionality of the learners, their situatedness, their identity, their social vulnerabilities, and the range of variables bearing on their social identity. Some papers or chapters argue that the events that were unfolding in, in institutions of higher learning were ultimately about power. Thus, provision of computers and data packages to students can only respond to what we call first order change in the organizational literature, where we replace one mode of delivery with another. It does not respond to what is called second order change, which involves changes to the schemata of the organizations itself, changes in the way that academics think about the way of delivering the curriculum, as well as changes in how learners think about the curriculum and doing uh, their learning. It also doesn't look into how we can bring to the table the marginalized views and listen to them attentively. In other words, argue some of the chapters. It does not incorporate what we call the philosophy of Ubuntu. But we also need to move beyond that to, organize, to, to realize that the challenges that were uh, occasioned by the COVID-19 pandemic necessitates that we put in place instruments to enable us to become a learning organization. In other words, it requires that we share our identity as an organization and together with our students jointly construe what it means to be learning in the context of COVID-19. Many of the chapters talk to this issue of Ubuntu, how we avoid uh, marginalization and ensuring that no one is left behind. But I do want to quote in particular, one of the chapters by Dr. Harry uh, Masondo uh, in the School of Social Sciences at the University of Guadalupe Natal which talks or is titled Umundu Agalashwa, meaning a human being is not dispensable. What this actually means is that no matter the challenges, no matter where the learners are coming from, we need to go uh, the extra mile to accommodate them and put them in, put ourselves in the shoes of those learners in order to understand what they may be going through. Ultimately, therefore, institutions' responses to e-learning is a matter of social justice. Not only should it take into account the cultural and social and uh, a social uh, and economic positionality of the learner, it should also involve what we call both and thinking, which is basically trying to think from the perspective of the other and also incorporating the Ubuntu paradigm. From the Humanities Institute's perspective, it is important that uh, we engage in this kind of discourse because as I've already indicated, there are many challenges that we are facing as a, a South Africans and Africans in general the biggest one being how do we deal with the question of cognitive injustice. So in a nutshell, many of the chapters in this particular uh, uh, volume seek to address that matter of dealing with cognitive injustice and ensuring that no learner is left behind. Uh, the challenges of uh, ensuring that no learner is left behind are identified and recommendations on how we can move in the future are highlighted. I thank you, program director. And I also want to thank all the authors 
who have contributed to this volume and the able leadership of our uh, lead uh, editor. Thank you. Thank you very much, Prof. Mkise. Um, the final volume is led by uh, Professor Ianni Smith and is titled Lena and Subject at the Dawn of the Digital Research-Led Teaching and Learning in the Time of COVID. Uh, Prof. Uh, Smith, could you talk about the volume, but also conclude with a word or two about how we take this series forward? Excellent. Thanks, Prof. Uh, thanks to all the professors and uh, my co-editors. It was such a pleasure working with you through this difficult time. Um, colleagues, um, just about uh, the fourth volume, you will see that the topic is a mouthful. Uh, and to a very large degree, all our volumes are just samples of research that have been engaged in due to COVID. Um, all of us were thrown into the deep end with the lockdown, the close down of the universities towards the end of March in 2020. And while some were still thinking about what we should be doing, many of the colleagues have already started to engage uh, the challenges that digital technology pose for all of us with regard to remote teaching and learning and remote uh, research, uh, remote supervision. And these were challenges that everybody had to engage, uh, whether they were senior professors or junior lecturers, and whether they were also tutors, everybody has had to think through the basics of how we engage remote teaching and learning and remote research. And, uh, and that is across the disciplines, also in the natural sciences. And in this final volume, we bring together some papers that provide a sample of the thinking that has gone into uh, the thinking through about how we continue to uphold the standards in our disciplines in also in uh, the standards in our assessment while we engage remote teaching and learning and remote research uh, basically through digital means. And all of the research that we have published have been produced within the first few months of 2020. The fact is all of us have moved forward for 2021. We are much better prepared. Uh, we have learned how to use the digital media better from Facebook to WhatsApp to uh, Loom and Zoom and also through the eLearn and the Moodle systems and other platforms, many other platforms that have been explored in the sciences. And this fourth volume captures some of the initiatives that have been taken in 10 disciplines and the 10 disciplines and uh, or areas that we have engaged in and that we selected for this uh, fourth volume are history, media, graphic design, music and dance, health sciences, commerce education, rural student studies, the challenges that rural students have been facing with remote teaching and learning, and then also um, uh, differently able st uh, students, the challenges that they have faced, and also social work. So there you have 10 focus areas in this final fourth volume uh, of these four volume uh, of uh, the first uh, number of uh, books coming from the um, Alternation African Scholarship Book Series. Uh, Prof, I'm going to stop there. I see we've got four or five minutes left. If there are any other comments or questions, uh, just a final word from my side. It was a great pleasure to work with everybody. I may just mention that there are still more volumes in the pipeline. Uh, and for some volumes, we have had more than 200 submissions of abstracts, topics, and so on, like um, also in the area of uh, leadership, school leadership in the time of COVID, in the area of uh, religion and COVID, in the area of uh, rural 
uh, uh, rural education and COVID and so on. So um, there are quite a number of books in production that will come that will be published in 2021 and also journal volumes. Thank you, Prof. Um, thank you, uh, Professor Smith. I was hoping that there would be time for a few um, questions from the audience or comments from the audience, but um, it seems we have run out of time. I would like to um, thank the audience for um, uh, coming to this session and would encourage you to contact the lead editors uh, individually, directly, if you have any particular questions um, about accessing um, the published volumes or um, uh, suggesting um, an area that, that, that is of interest to you. Um, and secondly, I would like to um, thank the panelists for their um, uh, contributions, but also um, to uh, thank um, Dr. Uh, Ismail Mohammed and his team for um, uh, allowing us to occupy this space during this last hour. Thank you very much.